Hi there. My name is Josh Thompson, uh, and this is a recorded talk. It's kind of weird to record a talk like this. Uh, usually when I um, you know, work with people, I get to be in the same room or at least in some um, synchronous communication, and there can be conversation and back and forth and questions and hopefully sometimes laughter and all those things. But we're in the middle of a pandemic, so everything is different. I so wish I could go to Rails Conference. Rails Conf. I've never been before. Um, and so hopefully next year we'll all get to be together. And um, yeah, so, so the reason I mention all of this is because uh, this is not my first time recording this talk and sharing it. Uh, I normally, when I give a talk, the moment I'm done, and I, I've only done a couple of them, so I'm not very good at it, but uh, the moment I'm done, I think of all the things I could have done better. But now, because I'm recording the talk, if I don't like the, how it went, I can just throw it all away and do it all over again. That can become very time consuming very quickly. So we're going to do what all great developers do. And any bugs that arise in the rest of this talk, I'm simply going to say it's a feature. Sound like a plan? Because I know none of us have ever done that. If there's an audience, that would be a great point to laugh. If there's no audience, there's no laughter. Uh, okay, we're gonna be talking about junior developers, junior developers, and I'm arguing that they're the solution to many of your problems. Now, this is a bold premise, and I don't expect many or most of you to agree with me now, um, but I hope that in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, um, we'll kind of converge on something where we both broadly agree with this statement. I'll have uh, these notes or these slides and other notes on my website, josh.works slash railsconf. Um, that is a website, .works. Um, so you can just punch that into an address bar and you'll go there. And then that's me on Twitter. Um, and there'll be other other notes from this as we go. Okay, so who am I? I've uh, Before I got into software development in 2017, by way of Turing, so hello, all of you Turing people out there. Um, I spent a lot of years in customer-facing roles, specifically for business-to-business, software-as-a-service applications. That informs a lot of how I uh, see the world and do my work today as a software developer, doing like sales and customer support and customer success. Um, when the website broke, I was the one that would answer the phone for the angry customers, and at the time, I had no idea what was going wrong. So. I've uh, got a lot of empathy and uh, respect for uh, people in customer-facing roles. And I think software developers are also generally safe to be loosed on customer-facing roles. Uh, so I've been working on Ruby and Rails ever since 2017, and I love it. And then lastly, I love to figure out how knowledge transfer actually happens. It's a weird thing. We'll talk about it later. Okay, so... Software development industry on junior developers has, generally has a specific thing to say. Uh, there's lots of different ways that they say it, but at the end of the day, they say, eh, we don't know. Uh, they say things like, we don't know how to handle junior developers, or um, our industry or our company is too advanced to be able to employ junior developers. Um, you know, we're trying to change the world. We don't have time to be altruistic uh, to junior developers, or it's, it's somebody else's problem. So I think the word junior is unhelpful, and I'll talk about the rest of those attitudes as well, but first I want to address the word that I've scare quoted here, junior. I think it's a little pejorative, um, so what I would rather than be called is, this is not a term I came up with, someone else did, but um, early career software developers, or the very easily pronounced XD. I'll be calling them early career developers for the rest of the talk. Um, so our updated title is Early career software developers are the solution to many of your problems. Now, uh, what? why is an early career software developer this thing um, that we're talking about? Like, what is what is it? Um, why did I, why am I choosing this phrase instead of a different one? Um, you know, maybe a new developer or just a developer or, uh, you know, there's lots of different ways that you could get to this. So. Um, the reasons I'm going with this phrase is rooted in a couple different places. Like I mentioned, I wasn't the one that coined it. I was Patrick McKenzie, Patty11 on the internet. Um, and then I read a couple of papers. Um, and this phrase, early career software developer, I think gracefully links the some of the core um, pieces of these three papers that we're going to talk about. So um, I like also I like to 
printout papers and then just like take a pen and, um, you know, sit in the outside on the porch on a pleasant day and just read through them. So uh, we'll be talking about these three papers. First, Structural Holes and Good Ideas by Ronald Burt from 2004. Um, he basically argues that persons that span structural holes inside of organizational maps um, provide disproportionately good ideas. So all that means is people that have that are rooted in different domains or different um, business processes or different business units, basically anyone whose knowledge spans between uncommonly spanned domains um, has a lot of value to bring. Um, so I'm now quoting from the abstract. The whole paper is worth reading. It'll be on the, on the website, but he says, persons connected across groups are more familiar with alternative ways of thinking and behaving. It's not shocking. That's not a bold premise, um, but it means that your early career software developers are possibly early career, mid-career, or um, very experienced in other domains. Um, there, I know uh, people that span many different industries that have gotten into software development, and some of them have been um, wildly competent experts in their domains before getting into software development. And so when we, when we sit down, I'm like, I'm not worthy. You're the expert here. They're so much better at their field than I am at software development. These kinds of people, um, really all of, the, all of the people that are switching careers into software development have intrinsic value. They're, they could have intrinsic value to your organization simply because they span domains. Um, okay, next. Uh, the Two Sigma Problem. The search for methods of group instruction as effective as one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Um, Benjamin Bloom, 1984, him and uh, some other uh, folks on his team put together this paper that said, with a certain set of interventions, um, individuals in experiencing whole group instruction between like one person and 30 students could experience 98th percentile or two standard deviations. That's where the two sigma comes from. Two standard deviations results better than the their cohort without those interventions. So imagine that you got a early career software developer that was the top 2% of early career software developers. And if you think that you would hire that person, um, I want you to think of, we'll talk more about that, but basically if that person is appealing and could be successful in your organization, there's a bunch of interventions and uh, methodologies that could make almost anyone that's successful inside your organization. Next, um, or lastly, is this paper from 2004 titled The Psychological Conditions of Meaningfulness, Safety and Availability, and the Engagement of the Human Spirit at Work. I don't know who helps scientists come up with titles, but um, it's not the same folks that work at BuzzFeed. This is a really important paper for a bunch of different reasons. Basically says that if you treat people well and with dignity and treat them like they're valued and independent persons, a lot of really good things happen. Uh, so highly engaged people at work do really good work. The literature is settled on this. There's no question. Um, that's why companies do employee engagement surveys. All of them are trying to figure out, are our employees engaged and help them become more engaged? Um, and the things that we're going to talk about will help kind of like reinforce these ideas. Um, none of it's rocket science. Uh, so here, reading from uh, the end of the, is page 33 under a section titled Implication for Management. Um, they have things like um, managers should also work to establish employee perceptions of safety by developing supportive, trustworthy relations with their employees. Now, that seems reasonable and, and dare I say obvious, um, but the reason I'm mentioning these three papers is because uh, later on, or actually I'll just jump to that now, I'm not talking only to one group of people. I hope to I hope that w persons watching this span at least three different domains. The executives, so that might be CEOs, CTOs, VPs of engineering, directors of engineering, um, and then experienced developers or engineering managers. So these would be uh, just the, the, not just, but the experienced engineers that are, that would be then working with early career software developers. And then of course the early career software developers themselves. All three of these people have different sets of problems and solutions and constraints about getting organizational buy-in. Um, and 
what I would like to do is if at any point while you're listening to this, you're like, oh, those are like that stuff that Josh is saying is interesting and it would be maybe nice to implement in my organization or get someone at my organization to care. Um, the reason I, I mention all of these papers is because these kinds of things, it's nice to be able to say, for instance, if you have to go to your CFO and get approval for funding for something, um, to not just say, like, we're treating our employees, you know, we're spending money and treating them better just because it's the right thing to do, which it is. But you could pull something like this and you could say, like, the literature from 2004 says if we can create these kinds of conditions, we get um, way better work. And so it's actually financially responsible for the organization to do something like that. So why I'm mentioning the papers. Um, now, we're going to find the right problems. We're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about the kinds of solutions, like how to identify solutions that relate to those problems. And then there's a very important third piece, which is often forgotten, um, is how to get organizational buy-in. And uh, most good ideas don't proceed to implemented ideas um, because of a lack of buy-in. Um, and so, this isn't something that you should necessarily even do in sequence, like find a problem, then identify a solution, and then get organizational buy-in. I would I'll argue down the road that these should all happen in parallel and in mutually reinforcing ways. So, um, carrots and sticks. The carrot for this, if um, you find what we're talking about to be compelling, and take action on it and are successful and not like overly constrained by, you know, the constraints that we're all constrained by. Um, you'll have more, uh, like the things that are important to you will go up and to the right. So that looks like maybe like money um, or feature delivery, like the rate of feature delivery or the defect rate, um, like regressions and stuff that, that'll go down. So sorry, things you care about will go up and things you want less of will go down. You'll have, you'll have more of what you want. Um, and you'll have lots of like, um, good feelings, like people will feel dignified and whole and seen and appreciated. Um, uh, and all of those are really good things. Um, so whoever figures this out first is going to outperform their cohort, uh, or who, whoever figures out how to take action on this is going to outperform their cohort. So if you're an executive, you're familiar with the Gartner's magic quadrant. And if your organization gets to take action on this, it will probably move up and to the right in Gartner's magic quadrant relative to other companies in your industry. If you're a senior developer or a manager, um, you'll outperform other persons who have that same job title in similar industries and organizations of similar sizes. And then if you're um, an early career software developer, um, you should keep listening because with this knowledge, you can shape your own experience inside of an organization to the benefit of everyone. Now. The stick, I couldn't find a good stick or branch emoji, and it wasn't for lack of trying, is whoever figures this out last is going to underperform their cohort. So there's going to be this group of early adapters, and then there will be more people, and then whoever is kind of here on the back um, is going to have, like, trend lines are going to go down, uh, and unhappy feelings will be had. So... Hopefully you'll feel motivated and that, you know, it's not like listen to this talk and then do something dramatically different next week. Like, you know, these, these kinds of things take time, but we'll, we'll talk about that. And with time and effort, um, surprising things can be accomplished. Surprisingly substantial things can be accomplished. Okay. Finally, just a reminder, uh, all of these papers that I mentioned, um, you can find links to them on my website, josh.work slash railsconf. Uh, if you want to leave comments or questions, you can do so there. And then um, I'll be in the Discord channel, which shares the title of this talk, Junior Devs Are the Solution to Many of Your Problems. And I would love to see you there. Um, yeah, it just feels so different than getting to talk with people, which I kind of miss. So come say hi in the channel. It'll make me feel better. Okay. Like I said, we're going to talk about problems. So we don't just want to start with problems. We also want to think about the solutions. And um, there's a bunch of traits of good solutions. And then, like I said, we're talking about organizational buy-in. Now, I want to 
because we have to dual track all of these at the same time, um, we'll talk about how the solution pairs with the buy-in and then kind of all of this can be had at once. So the right solution, um, probably in the context of this, of like how to um, get value and have a lot of success with early career software developers, probably means um, at minimum that your experienced developers are going to occasionally be working inten intentionally with early career software developers. I hope that's not a stretch, but there are there are teams where that kind of thing is verboten and uh, verboten. Not sure how to pronounce that, or even how to spell it. Um, but it's not it's not celebrated. The reason I say that is because of this paper, two sigma problem. Um, experienced developers working with early career software developers um, is pretty close to one on one tutoring. It's very close. Um, it increases the capacity of the entire team time. I'm sorry. Uh, so the traits of these good problems um, are when solutions increase the capacity of the entire team, not just one person. Um, and they tend to take time up front, but the right solution should pay off fairly quickly. So like I said, increases the capacity of the entire team, not just in the present time or present like slice of time, but should be something that can go forward and help future team members about that. Um, and of course, it should pay off fairly quickly. So the right solution would also, of course, have upfront investment, um, but meaningful returns. If you don't see meaningful returns, and others don't see meaningful returns, um, you're not going to be very successful getting organizational buy in. So our hypothetical example, not saying I've heard this ever spoken by anyone I've ever interacted with. But who hasn't heard this? Junior developers take too long to onboard. You know, people say it's going to take you three to six months to, you know, really be hitting the ground running um, with this organization. And junior developers just take too long and we're too agile and we need to move too quick. So let's run this particular pain point, which I'm actually thankful for this pain point because a lot of times people will feel kind of this nebulous discomfort around the idea of hiring just like a interchangeable junior developer from... Um, and like a software development program, you know, there's a bunch of different ones. I graduated from Turing. I really like it. Um, but there's a lot of different programs or someone just doing the self-taught journey. Um, there, it feels like there's this gap and people kind of just say it's, oh, it's onboarding. Like if I hire that person, it's going to take too long. So let's work through an example of this, the premise of this talk, which is um, junior developers are the solution to your onboarding woes. Um, and we're going to talk about how the three different groups of people, so executives, experienced engineers, or developer managers, and then early career software developers themselves um, can like work together to solve this problem. So uh, time to onboard. Um, first, uh, what is your time to onboard? This, if we're all in person, I would say, shout it out. How long does it take from... Uh, you know, someone getting access to the Git repository? and um, pushing their first ticket to production and deploying their first uh, ticket. Some people might say a week. Um, some people, usually the larger the organization, the longer that time is. So uh, a couple of weeks, it, it was for my first job, it was a couple of weeks, uh, probably before I was deploying code. Um, so this isn't just a problem for junior developers that it takes a long time to onboard. Um, it's a problem that we all face. And organizations that have a really long time to onboard, um, if, it's, if they get a senior developer, it's going to take that senior developer longer to onboard at that organization than it would take that same developer to onboard at an organization with a smoother process. So of course, the same is true for early career um, software developers. So. Let's solve this problem with early career software developers. Um, and we're going to talk about MVB, which is minimum viable buy-in. So before you're going to solve this problem, you're going to have to get people from a, a couple of different people on your team to agree that it's a problem and worth solving and to work towards that um, solution. So um, a lot of people see organizational buy-in as like a barrier 
to implementing good ideas. Um, and, uh, someone wrote a book called like the obstacle is the way, um, I don't know if it's a good book. I don't think I've read it, but the title really lands, um, getting buy-in is probably your best path to implementing anything that you might want to implement as a result of this talk or really any of the other talks here at RailsConf. Um, I would start with figuring out how to get buy-in and if you can't get buy-in, there's a bunch of things you can do, but, um, aim for buy-in. So, um, there's a bunch of critiques people might, uh, raise like, you know, we don't have time or, um, you know, we'll do it later. Uh, our engineers are working too fast on other things. Um, so what I might recommend is sit down with the other powerful person relative to this issue. So that might, uh, if you're a line level engineer, that might look like talking with the manager or the like, CTO or kind of whoever is one or two links above you in the food chain, um, or the, sorry, not the food chain. Um, I'm sorry, the organizational structure that was a little, uh, dark. Um, or if you're at the top of that structure and you're trying to draw your team into this direction, um, talk with the team lead or one of the, the engineers that's running the team. Um, so for instance, you could say if you're an executive, the medium to long-term health of our company requires us to keep hiring. And if we can only hire single, I'm sorry, senior talent we will always be hurting. Let's see if we can start making the engineering teams friendlier to less experienced engineers. It's likely some of our engineers would be happy to take some of this work on, um, because they're already doing it and we will reward them for it. If I was one of the line level engineers in that organization, I heard that I'd be like, oh, this is cool. These are things I'm already good at and inclined to do. So I'll just do a little bit more of that. So uh, we will use early career software developers to improve the onboarding. Now, what would be a good benchmark for a good onboarding um, metric for someone joining your team? This would be another opportunity that I would kind of turn it over to the audience and start hearing people kind of popcorn things off. I've heard um, someone say, you should be able to go from Git clone to testing, running tests within five minutes. Sounds really nice. Um, or, uh, let's see, there's, yeah, like maybe you should be able to have access to development staging, like, all access to the different environments and be able to like add your own profile picture to the um, meet the team page within 10 minutes, for instance, like sometimes it's just a matter of a, of a YAML file and you add a, um, you know, you add an image, uh, you link the image in the YAML file, you give the little bio bio there, and then you get push um, deploy. And now the like new person is there. So if the person, if you could hire an engineer, and by the end of that first day, they have changes in production. Um, that's really good. On the flip side, there are organizations that have like very complicated and slow release cycles. So those organizations are probably more, they have more to benefit from this kind of work than those that can just do it effortlessly. So how might we create a roadmap to you to let early career software developers improve your onboarding process? So again, you're an executive or a seasoned engineer um, on a team and you're wondering, can I go hire an early career software developer? I'm gonna say yes. So here's what that looks like. First, um, create a ticket in Jira or Trello or GitHub issues, however you track your work, create a ticket that says, um, or an epic, you know, it all depends on your, your preferences. Um, and that, that says something about improving the onboarding process and assign someone to it. You probably already have someone in mind to assign to this ticket. It's either you uh, or you know the person on the team that tends to do the onboarding work. Uh, when you when you add someone to the team, they volunteer, they're helpful in the Slack channel, uh, they already like kind of garden the readme or set up instructions, like that person, um, assign the ticket to them. The benefit of creating a ticket is it makes the effort legible at an organizational level. And that's very important for this buy-in piece because 
it's should be free or cheap to make a small ticket and pull it into the sprint um, or the current body of work. Uh, like people aren't gonna, usually you can get enough uh, overhead to do that. Um, but as you then move the ticket through, you can refer to it later or once it's closed, you can just kind of keep building on that foundation and then uh, you know you can, well, well, we'll talk about some of the other things that you can do with it. But I would recommend making the efforts legible to the organization and JIRA tickets or issues are a pretty good way of doing that. So next, the experienced engineer or whoever that person was that I said you probably have in mind, um, does the setup, like rebuilds the application on their computer from as scratch as possible. So that might look like um, making a new directory uh, in the, their users folder and doing git, like git cloning stuff and then running the commands as instructed in the readme. Um, often when you do this, you'll find some spots where there's gaps in the instructions. Uh, and you could, should fill them. So there's as a byproduct of this, there should be, a at minimum, a pull request to the readme of the primary application or the primary repository of your application or collection of applications that um, improves some of the information around onboarding. It might be looking like a list of the other applications that the engineer should also make sure that they clone down. Uh, maybe a place that they can go for getting like secrets and all the like config setup that they'll need that isn't in the Git repository. Um, but out of this will come a pull request with some notes that clean up the entire process. You've already read this whole slide. I'm sorry for violating the rules um, of making good slides or just having a lot of text on it. So next, um, when you hire a new engineer, this doesn't even have to be an early career engineer or an early career software developer. Just the next time someone joins on joins that team and has to run that app locally, uh, pair that that engineer should pair with them. You could create a second ticket, um, link it to the first whenever that you know could happen days, weeks, months later, and then that engineer that has an idea of what's in the guide should pair with the new engineer because that new engineer uh, isn't going to have the same stuff set up like maybe they don't even have Ruby installed on their computers. Now you're doing RVM or RBEM, RBEM I can't even pronounce it. Um, but you'll like keep finding little gaps in the process and then that new engineer themselves can make the pull request that fills in those gaps. Uh, and now the guide has gone through two iterations. First, the like an expert who's already on the team has improved it, and then they've kind of battle tested it with a new engineer. Um, and then finally, when you're ready to hire an early career software developer, that process should work pretty well. And you can use that early career software developer to refine it for one last time. Because once you go through that process and an early career software developer can make the whole thing work, like now you could just add anyone to the repository and know that within a certain unit of time, they'll be able to get it up and running. Now, it you might have a complicated setup, a complicated enough setup that it's a lot of work to get it this easy. Like maybe an engineer will have to dockerize the whole application or, um, you know, you'll have to create a good enough seeds file whole cloth from scratch. Um, you know, I've sometimes had to like, clone down obfuscated um, like or development data from like a staging environment into like a local environment to populate um, the database schema because like you know we didn't have any seeds at the time so that you know that slows it down and you could use an early career software developer to start building out some of that seed data um, you know th there's there's opportunities to say oh you ran into a problem onboarding like let's pair with an expert and figure out how we can make this smoother for the next person so the possible wins. What would come from doing something like this? First, at an organizational le level, you would be stating to your team and everyone watching the team that like we care about the onboarding process. And as uh, Peter Drucker said, I think it was him, you know, god of management um, theorizing, says like what gets measured managed. I think so. If you're tracking this kind of stuff on a JIRA ticket, uh, it'll start doing better just for just because you're attending to it. Um, you'll improve the infrastructure around your application. So that means deleting old and outdated instructions and adding good and new instructions. You'll get better um, 
resiliency around the data sets that you're using. Um, I've often run into problems with like seeding, or sometimes you run into problems seeding just data into the database. And the process of resolving that actually has a bunch of beneficial trickle down effects for others. Um, and maybe you get a couple of early pull requests from your new engineers. And if your early career software developers normally take three weeks to make their first pull request, and under this like um, effort, they're taking a week and a half to make their first pull request, you're cutting down the time to first value by half. Or first, like, yeah, time to first value. So find someone on the team to keep an eye on this metric. It doesn't have to be you. If you're a manager or a senior engineer or an executive, you probably have a lot of your on your plate and you're not just like casting about for one more thing to keep an eye on. But I would propose that I bet that there are people on your team that would really enjoy keeping an eye on this. And this would be like an easy way for them to um, create value and contribute in a, in a new way. Um, and then they can report on it. Maybe on standups it comes up or like every time a new hire is made, um, you know, someone talks about this and now that new hire is kind of brought into an environment where it, they're told when you experience friction, it's not that you're deficient, it's that we want to fix this and make it better and you know, squeeze learning opportunities out of it. So if a senior engineer cuts their onboarding time from four days to two or four days to one, um, an early career software developer might cut their onboarding from like two weeks to one week. Um, and that's a lot of payroll. That could be like, you know, depending on your all-in costs, that could be a couple grand in payroll. Um, conservatively $3,000 per engineer um, saved in onboarding time. And in addition to like, there's a bunch of other benefits like these extensions. So um, I talked earlier about having a minimum viable buy-in and usually onboarding and trying to make it a better process is, a, is not too large of a, of a leap. So what you can do is start working on the onboarding piece. And then as you start getting some wins, um, kind of tack on some extensions and just kind of keep, uh, keep pushing that thread as far as you can. And eventually you might find yourself becoming a very welcoming place to early career software developers. So what are these extensions? Um, next time you onboard an engineer, um, look like just think about what needs to happen between them getting access to the private Git repo and running, you know, Git clone and rake DB setup. And then like what happens between that, sorry, Rails DB setup, I was working on some legacy Rails apps uh, recently. Um, so what happens between like running the database setup commands and then when they are ready to go get a ticket? Uh, so you could start documenting those. Um, there could be like, you know, you could spin up a wiki in the repository that says like, you know, once you're done, once you're at the bottom of this readme and you've got the, you know, Rails server running and you can click around and see our, you know, data populating the environment or the application running locally, um, you know, go over here and create these, you know, copy these templated uh, Jira tickets or um, request uh, access to these, um, you know, various environments. Like there's a bunch of process that needs to go, um, usually to get someone from access to the repository to like able to be a full scale contributor to the um, development team. Um, and you could take a stab at writing those out. Uh, either you or the engineer that's watching this that's excited to take this on, or when you just hire a new engineer, say these are like send them to go watch this talk and say, we want to make our onboarding process better. Can you watch this and see what ideas um, crop up as you're onboarding? Um, next, I've often found like application demos are pretty common on teams I've worked on. So once you have the app running locally, uh, you'll screen share, or someone will kind of give you a tour of the application and show little, like gotchas and little tools and resources that are available to you. Um, what about recording one of those? Like you can just share, hop on Zoom um, and record it and try to like move fairly quickly and keep an eye on making it like a useful recording and then stick that video on like Wistia and embed it in your wiki. Now that one walkthrough that your engineer has done a bunch of times um, 
can be reused by others. And if that engineer is home or um, out sick or working on a different feature, it's still available. Finally, um, the last one is what about finding a ticket, a recently done ticket that encapsulates a lot of the work to be done. Uh, and But I, what I mean by that is like, a, so let's say there's a feature that's coming through and an engineer works on it, builds it, ships it to production, and it's, or like a bug fix. You can take that, say, like just save the commit shot somewhere or like a link to the pull request, and then just write it and say, hey, next engineers, or our, you know, the next engineer that joins, here's a really good feature that we built that kind of takes you through kind of end to end all of the pieces of the application. So what they do is they do git checkout, that SHA or the prior commit, and then they can take, um, they can practice rebuilding the commit and seeing like where the API endpoints, how those, how those are handled. If you're, if it's dealing with endpoints or how the front end is dealt with, how like all of the stuff inside of your application, if you just hand it to a new engineer um, inside of a pull request and say, you know, spend a day understanding this, um, a lot of good things could come from that. Okay, so this is what I basically was saying. Take it, uh, slides a little out of order. So this is basically just focusing on a time to first value. And when someone says it takes an engineers three to six months to do, like start delivering a lot of value, all I think of is three to six months, what's that other three months? Like, why not just say it takes three months and we know that confidently because three to six months sounds like someone's guessing and they don't have a lot of process in place. And that means that mm, there's probably some value being left on the table. Uh, or there's, there's opportunities to squeeze that time to first value um, shorter and shorter. And uh, a lot of engineers, when they're first joining a team, they feel a lot of imposter syndrome. And all they want to do is feel confident that they're delivering value. So that comes back to this, the psychological conditions of meaningfulness safety and availability and the engagement of the human spirit at work, this kind of um, effort being expended um, dignifies and is, is work done in advance of new hires. So you get to kind of like give them a little bit of a gift in this and in doing so, you know, good things happen. Um, I'm not very good at graphs. So I basically, if you're normal time to value, time moving forward takes this long and someone by doing this work gets it to this long, half whatever that original value is, that's a tremendous value to the organization. So that should be tracked and measured and celebrated and rewarded. And when you do your quarterly OKRs and your end of year compensation adjustments, these are the kinds of things that can feed into that and an organization can really reward and get a lot of value from. So better onboarding, this is another, just an example, it's not just that engineers onboard faster, but they start understanding the domain specific logic of your application. And I don't just mean like RSpec DSL, but I mean all of the business of your application. If you deal with um, e-commerce, there's gonna be a lot of um, like very specific objects and patterns and messages inside of your application related to e-commerce or payments or email or um, all sorts of things. As your onboarding gets better, you start getting closer and closer to um, the new hires really understanding the business. Maybe it, uh, at some companies I've seen people when they start, they get a you know their laptop and their whole setup, but they also get a book that's like, hey, here's here's one or two books that are about the domain that we do business in. And if you better understand that business, you can do better work as an engineer. Maybe not right off the bat, but eventually. For instance. Um, insurance and finance and um, mortgages and home ownership and uh, let's see, like I'm just listing domains that I know have a lot of very intricate rules around them that if the engineers have a good understanding of, um, they can make like wiser and better decisions inside of the application. So you deal with the pain already of not being a welcoming, welcoming enough place to early career software developers. I deal with this pain when new engineers have joined teams that I've been on. I've often wished like, oh, I wish I had a better process that I could just kind of 
hand you this thing at the beginning and then just know that you will be moving confidently and learning a lot as you move through it this entire process. So we all, the room that would be full of people, deal with this pain because our companies that we work for can't hire enough early career engineers. Um, so that hurts us. <laughs> uh, we've also all been early career engineers. Uh, so, or we are early career engineers. So no matter where you sit on this issue, uh, either you're an executive or you're a seasoned engineer or you're an early career engineer, um, you deal with this pain. Uh, so if you are the go-to onboarding person at your company, you have a lot of potential value to deliver here. If you're a team lead, um, or a senior engineer, you or under your tutelage, maybe a different engineer on your team can start hacking away at this problem and see really substantial gains, I imagine, quickly. Um, or if you're an executive in the organization, if you just start talking about this, people will probably listen. In healthy organizations, leadership um, has a lot of uh, sway. And so just by virtue of talking about something, you can kind of shape organizational priorities in that direction. Now, um, I care a lot about this as well, so you can always reach out to me um, and I'd be happy to help. A lot of this uh, came as I, um, well, basically I kept hearing from early career engineers that were getting rejected at roles because of this. And I was like, I'm tired of that. So this whole uh, talk is kind of like a clinch fisted protestation against that, uh, these events that happen daily. Okay, so how does you and your company and your team benefit? I just want to recap. Faster time to first value when you focus on the experience of your early career engineers. Um, you have a better and more reliable process around hiring new engineers, not just early career, but any engineer. Um, you get a better engagement of your current engineering talent because it can be very satisfying to do this kind of work and help others in this way. A lot of engineers really want to help people, but uh, depending on where you are in the organization and where the organization is, um, relative to the industry and like the end user, a lot of engineers feel kind of segregated and far away from customers or the people they're trying to help. So this is an opportunity to kind of dust off, um, you know, that, that desire and that opportunity. Um, and then, yeah, so engagement of current engineering talent per this, um, it reduces the burden on your senior engineers, um, when there's good bespoke company specific resources that skill up the engineers on the team that are less skilled, those senior engineers know that when they do work uh, to improve others' skills, um, it's kind of made reusable and durable. Um, and it makes legible these kinds of important themes um, for further improvement. Like I guarantee if your company starts thinking hard or your team starts thinking hard about the onboarding process and is able to get some organizational buy-in to make some wins around that, um, you'll see a lot of cool stuff come out of that. Um, I wrote here in my speaker notes, more money. Uh, that can mean a lot of different things. That can look like better feature delivery and so you know, winning market share, uh, which is more money. That can look like um, your team spending less resources on like, like getting more engineering done out of your current payroll or your current team size. So that means that there's more money in budget or more money remaining in the budget for other things. And then if you're at, a, at the line level engineer, like these are the kinds of things that you can work into compensation discussions. And um, like all of those, like the engineer themselves can work can with the company and be like, hey, here's the way I'm delivering a lot of value. Um, let's make sure the compensation stays like commensurate with that value. So everyone wins, everyone wins, or at least can win. Um, like I said, you're already feeling this pain. Um, so start listening to it. See if you can start finding it a little bit more. So, all right. Lastly, uh, yeah, you have more consistent hiring pipeline. Oh yeah, and if you can get like less skilled engineers more quickly to skilled engineers, um, that means that the engineers you're creating by virtue of hiring can now move to other places within the organization. Everyone benefits from that, can promote and hire within. 
uh, and then you can know six months from now, a year from now, you can reach out and just hire a batch of early career engineers and know that they're all going to be successful. Um, and that's like a really satisfying thing as a CTO. You don't have to stay awake and think like, Oh, what if, what if our one really senior engineer leaves? Um, there's less frustration across all groups. Um, by highlighting this, the, the framework for identifying and solving onboarding problems, um, when they show up, just like now people know that when they're onboarding and they're doing something in their repository, something goes wrong or something's confusing or unclear, they can just make the PR. They can fix it themselves. They can add clarity themselves. Um, you get happier engineers, better engineers. Again, the cost to not doing this, attrition, lost money, frustration, pain, um, and you're not future-proofing your engineering organization. Uh, all right. <sighs> um, thanks for listening. Um, I would love to hear from y'all wherever you sit in an organization. Um, these are things I care a lot about and like to think about and hear from others about and create resources that can serve others about. So this is how to get in touch with me. Um, I hope to meet all of you next year, the next Rails conference.